be clear, this is just only one talk, not the whole, you know, you don't get a full year plus of postdoc for just one talk. So our, uh, our first actual talk of our semester uh, will be Haiyan Nam, who is going to be a postdoc for at least one, and uh, depending upon how the job search goes, maybe two years here, and uh, so she'll talk to us today about her research, and uh, you know, if you like these things, you should talk to her, and she likes uh, working with people. So counting core partitions and numerical semigroups using polytopes. Thank you, Steve, for the nice introduction of me, and thank you for everyone coming here for my uh, presentation. Today I'm going to talk about counting core partitions and numerical semigroups using polytopes. And the things I wrote on the board, you will see later on my slide. So here's the outline of my talk. So I'm going to basically talk about uh, what they are, what are the partitions, and what are the core partitions, and what are the subtitles core partitions. And then I'm going to present two of my re uh, results in numerical semigroups. So um, first, let me talk about the partition. So uh, we say a partition of n is a non-increasing sequence of positive integers that sum to n. And we use the term p of n to denote the number of partitions of n. For example, partition is simply how we can break the numbers. So 4 can be just 4 itself, or it could be 3 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 1 plus 1, or 4 of the 1s in here. So p of 4 in here is 5. We may visualize the partition using the Ferris diagram. So Ferris diagram is simply um, when for a given lambda in here, we add that much uh, rec like squares for each row. So this is a Ferris diagram of this particular lambda. And each square in a, a Ferris diagram is called a cell. And for each cell, we can define a special number called hook length. So the number hook length comes from its shape. This is a partition of 17. So for this particular cell, we draw a hook centered at this cell, like this red line, and then count the number of cells on this hook. So we have four in, on its right, and one below, and one for itself. So the hook length of the cell is six. In the same way, we can compute the hook length of this particular cell, which is three plus one plus one, so five. And when you compute the hook length for every cell in this federal diagram, then we get this set of numbers. So this partition has hook lengths one through eight and 10. And this hook length is a key term to define a T-core partition. A partition with no hook lengths divisible by T is called a T-core partition. So for example, in this case, there is no hook length of nine so this is a nine core partition. And there is a no hook length divisible by 11 or higher numbers. So this is also a T core partition where T is greater than or equal to 11. And when you count the number of T core partitions, that's going to be infinite. This is because you, we can always develop a staircase partition like this, then it is always T core partition. So now it's time to talk about simultaneous core partition, which is for uh, two prime numbers a, uh, two co-prime numbers a and b. We say that a partition is a b core partition if it's both a core and b core. So the previous example is simultaneous nine and eleven core partitions, or it could be uh, twenty and uh, twenty and twenty-three core partitions, or something like that. And interestingly, in 2002, Anderson proved that the number of A and B core partitions, where A and B are co-prime, is finite. And moreover, this number is a generalized scalar number. So when we look at this example, then the, the number of three, four core partitions is five. And these are empty partition and four in here. So the natural question we can ask is, 
Is there a nice formula for the number of simultaneous ABC core partitions? We know that this is going to be finite when ABC are equal prime, but we want to find the exact formula for this one. So before doing that, um, let me talk about Paul Johnson's way. So actually, um, when Anderson found this formula, what she did was found a bijection between the set of AB core partitions and the set of lattice path with certain condition. And basically, she count the number of lattice path satisfying that condition to count the number of AB core partitions. But then here, Paul Johnson found a new proof of Anderson's theorem, which is from the bijective map of um, the set of a core partitions and so the set of integer tuples that <coughs> And this bijection was actually already well known before Paul Johnson mentioned about it. And what Paul Johnson actually did was extend this bijection to another C tuples that sum to zero and has additional condition in here where this i can be any number from zero to a minus one and then indexes are interpreted modulo A. And after some change of variables, Paul Johnson uh, made C tuple, found the bijection of C tuples to certain X tuples, which I'm not gonna uh, explain the details for now. But, and then like there's a change of variable from X tuples to Z tuple in here. And this Z tuple is much easier to compute because there is a congruence relation in here, but then we can get rid of this congruence, uh, congruence relation and then uh, make the cardinality, just compute the cardinality of this one and divide by A will give the number of AB cores. And computing the cardinality of this set itself is not difficult because we can use third and bars argument. In that case, we can compute that the number of AB core partition is equal to a generalized catalog number. Any questions so far? Yes. For those of us who live north of the Mason-Dixon line, can you say quickly what a stars and bars argument is? Oh, uh, stars and bars argument. So, um, so if, like, if you count this condition, in that case, you can consider um, like stars and uh, so like. There are several stars in here, and then we want to divide it into A many bars. So there are B stars in here, and we want to divide it into A many bars. And we choose like A minus 1 bars in here. So that's going to be um, B <coughs> plus uh, A minus 1, choose A minus 1. And then we have like, because of this congruence relation using the orbit argument, we have 1 over A term in here. And by computing this, we can see that this one is same as this one. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So by uh, extending what Paul Johnson did, Jinan Beck, Myungjin Yu, and I found a formula on expression for the number of ABC core partitions. We have several assumptions in here. And uh, for the change of variables, we have to assume that A and B are co-prime, but A and C does not need to be co-prime, but A does not divide C. And for each, two, each triple A, B, C given, there is a unique number L satisfying these conditions. In that case, this one over A comes from the uh, modular congruence relation. And we can compute the number of ABC core partitions by computing this um, the set of Z tuples, where there is a finite sum, finite L sum in here. And these inequalities, there are two inequalities in here, and these inequalities are true for all i from zero to a minus one, and indices are again interpreted modulo a. And we what we actually did is we found more generalized expression for the number of A, B1, B2, up to Bn core partitions. But because of lack of space, we only show the number of ABC core partitions in this presentation.
and to show how um to show like how we can use this theorem to get some correctly, let me introduce four correlates. Two are already known, and two we claim something new. And one correlate we got is uh, in 2005, Yang Zhengzhou computed the number of s s plus one s plus two core partitions, and we can recover this result. So by plugging b uh, b equal s plus uh, a equal s plus one b equal s and c equal s plus two, and computing all the values in here, this case gives l is equal to one. So simply l equals one means zi is bounded by some number and when you compute in this case this fraction is going to be 2 so we have a restriction for zi that is from 0 to 2 which is a um, strong restriction so we were able to compute this formula and then uh, in 2016 Wang generalized Yang Zhongzhou's result to this case so he considered the number of s, s plus d, s plus 2d core partitions, where s and d are co-prime. And we can also recover this result by plugging uh, a equal s plus d, b equal s, and c equal s plus 2d, and compute the same thing. Indeed, like the following two correlates we claim that's new. So we assume that a, b are co-prime, and a divides c plus b, which means that L in here is equal to 1. Then we can compute the number of ABC core partitions by adding a bunch of multinomials in here, where these YI comes from counting the number of ZIs in each tuple. And another thing we have is assuming that A and B are co prime, and A divides this. Uh, number, which means that L is now fixed, uh, fixed by 2, and we have a restriction for a C in here, then the number of ABC core partition is simply this number, where M is from this quotient. And this is proved by inclusion-exclusion principle, and because of this technical reason, we had a lower bound of C in here. But then the upper bound of C comes naturally because if C is greater than this number, um, this number we're going to call it later, uh, we're going to talk about it later, but this is called the Fermi's number of A and B. And if C is greater than this number, then C can be written as a linear combination of A and B with no negative integer coefficients. In that case, C is simply the summation of A and B. So the number of ABC core partitions is simply the number of AB core partitions, which is a generalized scalar number. So basically, we can classify the uh, L equal 2 case when C is greater than this fraction. And if C is less than that fraction, then this inclusion exclusion principle will give you a messy computation, which we just gave up. And now we're going to talk about how core partitions in numerical semi groups are related. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, so we're going to talk about um, how core partitions in numerical semi groups are sort of related. So this is an example of three, five core partitions. And let me focus on these three core partitions for now. And I want to assign the numbers to each core partition, starting from 0 for the first core center step in here. And we're going to follow the boundary of this core partition. And we're going to assume that this last horizontal line goes to infinity. In that case, we can attach the numbers from 0 to um, infinity. And this is not easy to read the numbers. So let me add some colors in here. So I assign red colors for the numbers corresponding to vertical line and blue colors for the horizontal line. And please don't forget that there's infinite even numbers like 9, 10, 11, and so on. <coughs> and let me do the same thing for the other, the other um, core partitions. Then can we find any parents in here? So what's interesting in here 
here is when you look at the first column of each partition, then um, the numbers from the vertical lines just recover on the first column of each partition. And then the rest of the blue numbers will give you the numerical semigroup. So now let me talk about the numerical semigroups. And for the numerical semigroups, I separate it into two parts. So the first part is the work related to last year GRWC. And the second part is regarding my thesis project. Let me give you a def definition of numerical semigroup first. So we consider a subset of no set of non-negative integers is a numerical semigroup if it satisfies three following conditions. First, zero must be included. Second, it is closed under addition. Third, the complement is finite. So for example, like, and here we have more definitions to go. If there is a positive integer a1 through an satisfying this condition, <coughs> then this set is always a numerical semi-group. Uh, this set is, uh, the element of this set is simply the linear combination of a1 up to an uh, with non-negative integer coefficients. And this set is called the numerical semi-group generated by a1 up to an. And let me give you the example of numerical semigroups. Um, one easy example is the numerical semigroup generated by one. In that case, we have all the in all the positive integers in here, and also it includes zero. So this is a set of non-negative integers. And we can also consider the set of numerical semigroups generated by two and three. So it contains all the numbers but one. <coughs> and for this case, it is generated by a, a plus one up to two a minus one. Then it has all the numbers starting from a and zero. And another generalization of second one is uh, the numerical semi group generated by two and some odd number greater than one. Then it has all the um, even numbers in here, and starting from this odd number, it has all the numbers greater than b. However, the set uh, of multiples of three is not a numerical semigroup group because complement is not finite. And these are the three terms I wrote on the board. Uh, this is because like those three terms, I'm gonna refer them a lot. So just in case you forgot in the middle of talk, you may refer the board. We have three invariants of numerical semigroup, group, which are Fermanis number, genus, and multiplicity. Fermanis number is the largest number in S complement, and genus is a cardinality of S complement, and multiplicity is the smallest non-zero number in S. For example, if we consider the set gener generated by four and seven, then S complement is this set, which is a finite. Uh, all, each element of S complement can be called by get. So S complement is also called by the set of gets. And here, the largest number in S complement is 17. So the Fermanis number is 17. And the genus is a cardinality of S complement, which is nine. And multiplicity is the smallest non-zero number in S, so that's gonna be four. And what's known about them is, um, from Sylvester, we know that if A and B are relatively prime positive integers, then we can compute the Fermanis number of Fermanis number and genus of the numerical semigroup group generated by A and B. And for the main majority of quotient of numerical semigroups, groups, let me also define this term, the quotient of numerical semigroups. groups. We let this be a numerical semigroup, group. And among the elements of numerical semigroup, group, we collect all the multiples of Z and then divide by D. Then the set of those elements is 
the quotient of neuroquesimal group quality. And we can is uh, it is not difficult to see that as quotient by D is also a neuroquesimal group because uh, we collect all the multiples of D, that means zero is included and it is close by addition. And because S is neuroquesimal group, uh, the complement of S quotient by D is also finite. And we can define the Fermi's number and genus in the same manner. For example, if we have the set, the numerical semi group generated by 3 and 5, then for the S quotient by 2, we collect all the even numbers 0, 6, 8, 10, and so on, and divide by 2, which is 0, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So the Fermi's number is the maximum number not in S, which is 2, and genus is the number of elements not in S, which is also 2, and multiplicity is the smallest one in S, uh, which is not 0, so 3. Uh, what's known about uh, this quotient is when A and B are uh, co-prime numbers, then we can compute uh, the genus of the numerical semi-group generated by A and B quotient by two. And they, like, they split into two cases to compute this result. But then like, um, to talk about what's known about the Fermi's number, let me define another term called D-symmetry. So here is some odd um, definition of the D symmetry. If n is not in S, that uh, but from its number minus n is in S, whenever n is a positive multiple of D, then we say that S is D symmetric. This definition will be um, cle more clear if we know about the um, from this uh, numerical semi-group polynomial, which I'm going to introduce soon. So one symmetric numerical semi group is symmetric, and two symmetric numerical semi group is pseudo symmetric. In in 2015, Sturgeon T proved that for a D symmetric numerical semi group S, we can find a relation between this Fermi's number and Fermi's number of original numerical semi group, where we can represent this one in terms of x. And this x is the smallest positive integer uh, in S, satisfying this congruence relation. So we can see that this formula depends on the numerical semi group itself in x. And this is the last term I'm going to define before showing uh, one of my main results. Uh, Hilbert series is a uh, Simply the series, simply the sum of xd power, where that power comes from the elements of the numerical semi group. And for each Hilbert series and for each numerical semi group, we can define the semi group polynomial, which is defined in this manner. And this is a polynomial because S has finite complement in it. And Actually, this symmetric part comes from this polynomial in here because um, when this condition is satisfied, then this polynomial is D-symmetry. Then this is a main, one main result we did in JWC. Uh, yeah, Steve Butler is in there. And when S is a numerical semi group and D is a positive integer, then we can compute the genus of S quotient by D using this formula. And as a corollary of this result, when A, B, and D are relatively prime integers, then for each triple, we can compute A star satisfying this relation. And we can find a, a formula for this genus. Any questions? Okay, then let me move on to another, um, the, my last research 
about Brasson-Ross conjecture and Kaplan conjecture. This Kaplan is my PhD advisor. Um, Brasson-Ross conjectured that when n of g is the number of Dirichlet semigroups with genus g, she conjectured the following three things. In um, one like this inequality and these two limit equality shows that this n of g is growing like Fibonacci numbers. In in 2013, Zai proved that this limit is finite where this constant is at least 3.78. And by looking at this limit, we can actually imply these two conject this these two part of conjectures. And then this implies that this implies the first conjecture when G is sufficiently large, but then we do not know what is the lower bound of G satisfying this inequality. And moreover, uh, what's, what makes this conjecture very difficult is so far we know the value of n of g until g is equal to 68. So computing g equals 67 to 68 takes one year from by computer. So it's almost impossible to get the value of say n hundred. That's, that's going to take really long time. So we even do not know what is the value of and 70, like an 80 or something higher than that. So the first part of conjecture is still open for a general g greater than or equal to two. And so to attack that conjecture, we can consider the weaker version of cross summers conjecture, which is that n of g is increasing on g. And in 2011, uh, Nathan Kaplan made another conjecture that will imply Brassamor's conjecture. So here, he defined another term called the numerical semigroup, uh, the number of numerical semigroup with multiplicity m and g less g. And for the fixed multiplicity m, uh, n m g is growing on g. So now we are interested in how to compute this object n m g. Yes. Do you have anything like the Fibonacci relation for the n of m g's? Uh, as far as I know, no. Any other question? So on the previous slide with the conjecture is just about the yeah, so if, if you can't compute a lot of these, what, why, do you know why people think this might be true? If you can't compute a lot of the values? So, um, yeah, like, this, like, uh, well, first, this is just given, uh, like, first I was just conjecture that, and then, like, um, after Jai proved this, people just believe that this will be, like, true for a sufficiently large G. So I think like that's one reason why people believe in this conjecture and think this is going to be true. But then, um, well, uh, in conclusion, I couldn't like, so far this is open conjecture right now. And I don't think people can have like brilliant idea, idea to attack this conjecture yet. So we're not sure if it's true or not, but then, um, because of some some evidence until like some numbers in here in this theorem, I think that's why people kind of believe that this is true. What about for small multiplicities? So if you look at the Fibonacci type thing with the M's in for small multiplicities. Oh yeah, this one is only about the genus part. Yeah, and yeah, then, I know, but yeah. if you throw uh -huh. in the multiplicity uh -huh. as well, uh -huh. like you did for the this move one, forward. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's actually what I'm going to do right now. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah, so how do we compute this one? That's what I want to talk about for the rest of this talk. 
We can actually compute N3G pretty easily after some sort of uh, inequalities that I'll show pretty soon. Um, so this, this one comes easily from Kuhn's theorem, and I'm going to introduce Kuhn's theorem uh, in a few slides. And then um, after computing this, people generally want to compute what is going to be NMG in here. And last year, these three people compute N4G when G is greater than or equal to 9. And you may notice that I didn't even write the full uh, equation of this part. It takes about five lines to uh, write the full uh, formula. And then what they did was they chopped this uh, space NMG using the Fermi's number and compute the number of integer points in each space and then like add up. That's how they got this like somehow formula. But then they used their same method to compute N5 of G and it takes full three pages to write down the formula for N5 of G. So this work, yeah, this, uh, this method uh, does not give a general approach to do it. And um, so we got to think about like how to recompute this one. And here is a formula we got. So when g is greater than or equal to four, uh, this is luckily one line uh, formula for N4G. And by looking at this, we can easily show that Kaplan's conjecture is true when m is equal to four. And now from now on, I'm gonna explain how I got this theorem and what's more uh, behind that. To explain about the Kuhn's theorem, uh, I have to explain this uh, preset. For a given numerical semi-group, we can define the R preset using its multiplicity. So like, let me explain through the example in here. A season a season numerical semi group generated by four and seven in here. Then, and here we know that the multiplicity of S is four. So for the R preset, we're gonna collect the elements from the numerical semi group. That is the smallest number congruent to I mod multiplicity. What I'm saying with this is zero is the smallest number in S congruent to zero mod four. And 21 in here is the smallest number congruent to 1 mod 4 in S. And 14 is the smallest number congruent to 2 mod 4 in S. And 7 is the no, smallest number congruent to 3 mod 4 in S. So a preset of S with respect to the multiplicity is given in here. And then what's good about this is when you rewrite those numbers, by the multiplicity times some quotient plus remainder, then sum of quotient is genus of S. And this is not a coincidence. This is a theorem by Selmer. So when S is a numerical semi-group with all preset this, then some of the Ki's in here gives a genus of S. And here's a Kuhn's theorem that I mentioned earlier. So Kuhn's theorem gives a bijection between numerical semigroups with multiplicity n and the set of integer points in a rational polyhedral cone defined by those sort of inequalities. Here, this is like this index i range from one to n minus one, and this inequality is true for all tuples of i j satisfying this inequality. And this is true for all tuples of ij satisfying this inequality. Then this gives a map from a numerical semi group with multiplicity m to its opri tuple. So simply, like, this is a polyhedral cone, so the number of tuples satisfying this inequality will be infinite. But then combining with the Selmer inequality in here, so we can get, we, we know how to compute NMG. So this, equa this equation and these inequality will give a bounded uh, polytope and 
by computing the integer points in that bounded polytope, we'll give a formula for the number of numerical SMA groups with multiplicity m and genus g. Any questions so far? Okay, so that's why I wrote some inequalities in here. And as you can see from here, uh, I'm going to talk about m equals 6 later. So um, these are the inequalities from the Kuhn's, uh, Kuhn's theorem. And um, the proof is related to the quotient of numerical semi group. So let me recall the definition. The quotient of numerical semi group by D is collecting all the elements of uh, multiples of D in S and divide by D. And here's an example again for the recall. Here, I use the term S4G for the set of numerical SMI groups with multiplicity 4 and genus G. Then we're going to use the quotient by 2 to divide this set S4G. Then we can consider this N4G as a summation of these terms, where this is equal to the number of numerical SMI groups with um, where the quotient is generated by 2 and 2i plus 1. So what's good about this term is we know that this S quotient by 2 is generated by 2 and 2i plus 1. That means S is going to be generated by 4 and 4i plus 2. So simply multiply 2 to each term in here. And then there will be some odd numbers in there, so 4k1 plus 1 and 4k3 plus 3. So we can see, we can kind of see that S is generated by those four numbers if S quotient by 2 is generated by 2 and 2i plus 1. And this means that we're going to fix k2 by a number i. So here, instead of K2, we have K1, K3, and I's in here because I is fixed by, uh, K2 is fixed by I. And all the lines uh, in this figure comes from the inequalities in here. And then when G is bounded by 2I and 3I, in that case, uh, the number of points we have to count lie on this blue line. So for N4GI, just simply we count the number of points, integer points on that line. And when G is greater than or equal to 3, all the structures are the same, but counting, like, count, we count the number of integer points on this red line. Then we can compute the values of N4GI in general. So we can conclude that N4G is this summation, and um, Kaplan's conjecture is true when m is equal to 4. And now we're going to try to extend this one when m is equal to 6. So I'm not doing it for m is equal to 5, because I want to use this rule quotient by 2. And, um, so S is in S 6G, so multiplicity in genus G, and T is S quotient by 2. So we have like 3, 3, 3 plus 1, 3B plus 2, for some A, B in here. Then by multiplying 2, S has to be generated by 6, 6A plus 2, 6B plus 4, and some odd numbers in here. And then from the Selmer equation, we know that K3, uh, like from here, we know that K2 is equal to A, K4 is equal to B. And from Selmer equation, we know that K3 is equal to this one. So we originally get some equation from the Kuhn's theorem. And then plugging those information to there, then we have this set of inequalities in here. And now we're going to do a similar thing as we did for m equal 4. In that case, um, we're going to let this m6gab 
be the number of numerical separator groups with multiple six genus G and quotient by two is this one. Then we consider the reason from the inequalities of A and B. We also know that A and B are greater than or equal to one. So we have some reason for A and B. And we know that sum of A plus B can go up to G minus three because Ki's are greater or equal to one. Then that's the reason in here. So please note that this is a reason for A and B. So these boundary, including this boundary, this is a reason R for the um, points, tuples A and B. And for each A and B, we have to compute, for each A and B, we have to compute the um, two, like triples K1, this is K5. The K1, K3, and K1 and K5. Um, so let me see the boundaries first. So for the boundary, when B is equal to 2A, we also divide into three cases depending on the values of A. And if A is less than or equal to this case, this is an awesome case that when you con consider the intersection of these three lines, then we are going to get triangle for the boundary case. And this triangle is exactly inside of the rectangle made by the restrictions of K1 and K5. So simply in that case, all we have to do is count the number of integer points in this triangular shape. And by computing this, uh, moving this like red line, then we can, we know that this is equal to this formula. And cases get more complicated. So this case is when um, there is a rectangle from the range of K1 and K5. <coughs> And this is a triangle we have, and we're looking for the intersection of it. So all we have to do is count the number of integer points in this rectangle, uh, this triangle, which is going to be uh, this formula. And then we have one more case to consider. In that case, the intersection of rectangle and triangle, triangle, in here is sort of this shape, but this shape gets better because this D is equal to C, so it's going to be simply this shape. And by counting all the integer points in that pentagonal, we can get this formula. And we'll just keep doing this process for every reason in here. So when we look at the reason of A and B, we had some boundary cases in there. And then um, after computing the boundary cases, we also have to compute the interior parts in there. And for the interior parts, we had to separate into that many reasons. And I computed case by case. And for one case, uh, A, B are in R1. Then for the interior case, the intersection of those inequalities is now hexagon instead of triangle. And this is the case when this rectangle, uh, the, the hexagon is completely inside of this rectangle. So all we have to do is compute the integer points in the hexagon. And luckily this CF is also on the line of y equal x plus something, which means um, the line CF is parallel to DE and AB. So we can just compute in that way, y plus x plus something, then we get this formula. In another case, say like uh, reason 3 comma 2, then we have some cutoffs in there. So by computing this, the integer point inside of um, this, we get this more complicated formula. And by computing all the things in there, I was able to find a formula for N6G and then prove the Kaplan's conjecture is true when M is equal to six. So another future, like this is the last part, future work. 
Uh, I mentioned about the formula for the number of core partitions A, B, C, but then can we find the formula for the number of A, B, B, C, C, A core partitions? And this is a different case than what I found because for this case, I assumed that A and B are co prime, but then for this case, A and B never be, like uh, A, B, and B, C never be co prime. And regarding the um, Question of A, B, C. We only found a formula for G of A, B quotient by D. And what happens if we add more terms in here? So, for example, we can we find a nice formula for this particular case? And last thing is regarding the um, NMG part. So. What we did was we compute NMG for M equal 4 and 6, which are even numbers. So can we prove that this is true for true for all even numbers by using the recurrence relations? So can we somehow build a recurrence relation among the um, among N to M G and N even G for uh, that even number less than or equal to 2 M? And can we somehow find a recurrence relation and find a formula from there? That's it for my presentation, and thank you. Questions? Um, so, since you, you were looking at the, the um, cases when M was 4, when M was 6, um, do you know how those interact when you, with each other? Do, can you compare, going back to like the original um, uh, statement that you were looking at of how it compares when M is different, but comparing how the G values change with each other? Like how do the values of N4G compare with the values of N6G with each other? Do you have any insight as far as how those are connected? Oh, uh, honestly, no, because like the formula of N6G is really complicated. So I had some partial sums on the slide, and there are about like 20 different partial sums like that. And um, I, so yet I couldn't find the simpler form than uh, just listing all the partial sums in there. So, uh, but then like for N4G, for uh, the formula was really nice, so not yet. But I hope to find some intu to intuition in there because like that will help to do the future work for me. Right. Mm. Have you tried using symmetry arguments at all? So if you have a what do you call the numerical semigroups, mm -hmm. I call think of them as cofinite submonoids, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, if you have one of those with multiplicity m, you can just shift all the non-zero numbers by a constant amount. C mm -hmm. to get multiplicity m plus c, and that will still be a submonoid. Because if you shift all the numbers from that, m, yeah. then yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, have you used symmetry arguments like that to try and make uh, cross oh, connections no, between? No, okay. not really. Yeah. 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 Thank you for a new yeah. idea. And also scalar multiples. So look at the group of. Transformations that take one of these and always embed into another are different multiplicities, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'll think about that. That might give more information. Uh -huh. Other questions? Let's sing the speech. <laughs> <laughs>